Okay, hello. So sorry for uploading this so late. I've just been quite busy recently. So basically, I'll just go through what happened in the first lesson, which only a few of you showed up. So hopefully, you guys will learn something from here. But I, for this, I'm expecting that you have at least some physics knowledge. So I won't go through basic stuff like what's Newton's first laws, what is like for example how do you calculate force what's a free body diagram i expect you all to know that already so i won't be going through that so basically i'm going through celestial mechanics and i'm going to do it from the problem solving point of way so if you think that you don't really understand the concepts behind this it's better that you go find a youtube video out there that already explained this quite well so i'm just going to use this in the context of astro astro astronomy and astrophysics problems uh. So basically, we have here what we went through is that, for example, if we were to use the Earth-Sun model, we'll model the Sun as this ball of mass. But we can treat it as a point mass because the Sun is roughly spherical. And also, it's a radius R, R which stands for the radius of the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. So we're assuming the Earth is so massive that the center of mass of the whole system is the center of the Sun. Thereby, like, Earth's mass is like negligible when you're calculating the the, the orbital radius. However, Earth does has a mass small m, Sun has a mass big m. And you know that because these two do have masses, there will be a gravitational force that is exerted between them and they are attracted to each other. And so you know that there's a force of gravity acted on by the Sun on the Earth. And similarly, because of Newton's third law, there's also a force acting by the Earth on the Sun. So naturally you think that this will cause the sun to go into orbit also, which of course it does. But however, this effect is quite negligible when you compare it to the motion of the earth around the sun. So you know, now you know that they're going in the orbital radius r, and you will know that earth is moving in space with a orbital velocity v, and has this mass m. So from here we can use equations of circular motion to help quantify this. So we know the centripetal force, which is the net force acting on it. Remember, it's always the net force. It's not like an additional force acting on it. So the force of gravity being the only force here must equal the centripetal force. Given that number one, yeah, it's the only force there. Number two is in the same direction as centripetal force. Centripetal force will always point towards the center of the system, the center of mass, like I mentioned before. That we're assuming the center of mass is the center of the sun. So you have these equations, mv squared over r and m omega squared r. Omega is simply v over r where omega is equal to angular velocity. <coughs> so, and also, you should, it, it, this is something good to know that omega equals to 2 pi over t where t is the period of the orbit. So if you equate this two together, this, okay in mind this is assuming circular orbits equate this two together, you can rearrange it to get Kepler's third law of course uh, there's some other fancy way that you can derive it for elliptical orbits but you can just cheat and convert r to a where a is the semi-major axis yeah so that's like the entire basics of celestial mechanics of course problems can come out all different kind of funny ways like your comprehension passages so that's something i can't really teach you have to experience it for yourself and do the ioa problem booklet as for this you know this kinetic energy is half mv squared m is the mass of the moving object and v is its velocity so you can see that the earth has a kinetic energy and also has gravitational potential energy which is given by minus gm m over r where m is mass big of these are masses of the two separate objects that attract each other actually the only reason this is negative is because we're taking the reference point at infinity to be zero so when an object is infinitely far away from that it will have zero potential energy as it get closer so it will get negative because it's attracting so it's like when it accelerates it picks up more energy then it gains like gains more negative potential energy i'm not sure how you can look at it but it just you can it's a very convenient way to set our reference point. So total energy will be given by this. So you can use the Virio theorem, which basically states that total energy will also equal to minus gmm over two r. You notice here. 
um, yeah there's a way to derive this but you don't really have to know you can apply this on your own <coughs> and then you can equate by equating these two together you get v equals 2 gm over r which will give you escape velocity <coughs> actually Oh wait, there's a calculation error here. Um, what? It gives you square root gm over r, which this will give you orbital velocity. Yeah, so this is what I mentioned before. You use the virial equation, you can get orbital velocity. But then you may ask yourself, not all orbits are circular. In fact, very few are. So uh, if you want to apply these ellipses, you can use the vis viva equation, which basically states that the orbital velocity for any object in elliptical orbit is given by this equation, which is g, which is gravitational constant times m, the mass of the whatever the thing is orbiting which can may or may not be the sun because you know like the moon orbits the earth sun the sun may or sun and and the earth orbits the sun and you as I mentioned before the sun can also orbit earth but the effect is much smaller so you get 2 divided by r which is the current distance between the two objects and 1 over a and a is the semi-major axis now to quickly explain what semi-major axis is first we measure ellipse and ellipse has two points at its foci. What semi-major axis is basically what happens when it is the distance between one edge and the center the longest like this is this is called the major axis and this one is called the semi major axis which we just label as A you can calculate this using eccentricity, but you should learn, you should have learned that in math, so you don't need it yet. And another important way of solving celestial mechanics problems is using angular momentum. Angular momentum represented by L is just like a measure of like amount of rotational movement it has. So in this case, we can use the formula mass of the of the orbiting object v, which is the velocity of the object which we're referring to is the tangential velocity so like just now we are saying it must be the tangential velocity of the object so it must move in right angles con as compared to the radius so you know like that it's moving at this way out yeah and so we know we know this and what happens is that this is always conserved and there's no external force just like how energy is conserved so to sum it up in celestial mechanics there's three main ways to solve problems it's either you use a force approach which will involve Kepler's third law an energy approach which will you use the virial theorem or even last but not least you could use the angular momentum approach using this equation of course you may think huh this short equation of course you can because like for example if L before equals L after provided there's no external force then that will mean that if M remains the same it cancels out if V and V and R will change then because you can't just have one changing and those V two equal right so it will help you a lot in solving problems you want you can try questions 1 through 6 of the IOA book of chapter 1 to practice this <coughs> And <coughs> for this other sheet of paper, we're just going through question 11 of the IOA booklet for chapter 1 Celestial Mechanics. So we're just explaining what radiation pressure is. So radiation pressure is basically, imagine for example, imagine for example, there's this sun here. And then there's this dust particle that has a diameter d. There's one astronomical unit away, which is 1.5 times 10 to the power 11 meters which is the distance between the earth and the sun 
So the density of this dust grain is 10 to 1000 kilograms per meter cube. So what you can do is like just now use the force approach. What you know now is that the dust grain is being acted on by radiation pressure and it's also being acted on by gravity from the sun. So you know gravity is GMM over R squared gravitational force but you don't know radiation pressure. So what you can do is you can model it, the dust grain as being like at, at the surface of the dust grain there's this flat surface and a photon comes in, it comes in with energy with energy E equals PC oh yeah, for photons you should know that energy is E equals PC or E equals HF like what is this, it's so weird P is just the momentum of the thing even though light has no mass, it still has momentum and C is just the speed of light or it can equal to the Planck's constant which is just some constant times the frequency of light because you know that higher frequencies have higher energies and so because of this we can model it that the photon comes in as a, as a like a ball of light it comes in at this, at this momentum and then it bounces off directly because we're assuming that the dust grain is a black body so it just it bounces off, like absorbs and radiates everything so it gets absorbed and then it bounces off you notice that this momentum you think they are the same right? however there's one important thing to note Momentum is dependent on direction. So for example, it's coming in this direction by coming out the other direction, the opposite. So what happens in this one, if you take this as positive, then this will be negative. And the difference between the two will be two times of this. So you can see the change in momentum is equal to this E over C times two. And so we want to calculate force. Force is just change in momentum over change in time. So you can get 2 EOC which is change in momentum times 1 over change in time. So what we do next is we use, we have our, fo our formula for radiation pressure. We substitute back into this equation and then we can use this equation energy equals power times time. So basically So we know that this is the force exerted by one photon. So what we what we want to do is we have to find number of photons. And we know that we since we know the energy of each photon, we can calculate the number of photons per unit time by using the power of the sun, which is solar luminosity. Then we have to also multiply it by the fractional collecting area because the dust screen is like so small and so far away. So one way to look at it is like the sun, the radiation or the light from the sun is expand, it's like an expanding sphere. So when it expands, you know what happens, right? It gets dispersed over an area. So this dispersion is proportional to one over r square, as known by inverse square law, because you know like it goes from one sphere to the next sphere, it increases in surface area proportional to r square because surface area of a sphere is four pi r square. So with that, you can substitute solar luminosity into here. Then you can times the collecting area. And then you can divide by the... Wait, where did it go? <coughs> yeah, so you get the power of the sun, the energy provided by the sun. Divide by C, which is the momentum change. This is the change in momentum. And then this is the time interval, and you notice that the time intervals cancel. So it is very convenient. So sometimes you may not know that, so it's always good to try questions. And it times the collecting area, which is which is 2 pi r square in this case, as I, I took it that only half of it was being illuminated. But I can take 4 pi r square if you want, so depends on you. And then we divide by 1 over 4 pi r square and this r refers to astronomical unit because you know the light from the sun is spread out over a sphere with radius 1 astronomical unit so that way to take a fraction of this which this will be the fraction and then you just do math and rearrange it and eventually you end up with something like this which you can solve for d given that you can just bring this over and the d will cancel out. And did I solve it back? No, I didn't solve it at the back. So you can go back and try question 11 if you have time. So basically what this leads into is the concept of Eddington luminosity. 
So what it means is just that how bright is that dust grain that I just mentioned. So how bright would it be? So that's something you can calculate without use without having to use the momentum but using just the energy received by the sun. You can assume that all the energy is being absorbed and, and being emitted by the by dust grain. So from there you can calculate its luminosity, which is called Eddington luminosity. And so the last point I went through for that day was that for Lagrangian points, a Lagrangian point is just a point where an object can orbit with the same orbital period as whatever your reference point is. So for example, in the Sun-Earth system. So at each of these points, any object can orb any object independent of the mass can ob orbit with the same orbital period as Earth. So how is this possible? <coughs> well, you know that the circular motion is provided by the centripetal force, right? So at L1, you can see there's a force by the Sun and a force by the Earth. So this net effect is the centripetal force is weaker than it, it would be if it were just the Sun. So this would mean that you orbit slower when it's supposed to orbit faster when it's closer to the Sun. As you know, like Mercury, Venus, they all orbit faster. And that's an easy consequence of the Kepler's third law. Is it third law? Yeah, I think so. Like T squared is proportional to A cubed. <coughs> so what happens is that orbit the same orbital period. However, one thing you notice is that these all have different configurations. However, the only the main assumption that you must make is that either the sun is the center of the mass, so you can that's what will make your calculations a lot easier. Or you can say it's orbit around a common center of mass. So this is only valid with sm like small objects, like large differences, like the sun and earth. If you're doing like sun and Jupiter, then you have to use this second assumption that it orbit around the common center of mass. Uh, so this is a bit more difficult, and you have to practice math. I believe there's a question inside the IOA booklet, somewhere near the back of celestial mechanics that you can try. Yes, asking about Lagrangian points, yeah. <coughs> so L1, L2, L3 are all unstable points. So why are they called unstable? So what it basically is unstable because if they move closer to the other side, they'll accelerate to the other side. Like if they move a bit closer to the sun, the sun pull get a bit stronger, the earth pull get weaker, then accelerate this way, and it won't be able to stay in that position. However, for L4 and L5, you notice that they are basically symmetrical. What happens is that L4, L5, they are being pulled towards the Sun and pulled towards Earth at an angle. So what happens is that it's actually a region of space and not just like a point in which they can be st in a stable orbit around the Sun with the same orbital, orbital period as the Earth. So I'm, I'm just referring to Sun-Earth case. Uh. But this can apply to other systems like binary stars or exoplanets. So don't be surprised if those things come up. So what happens? It gets pulled this way at an angle. So using trigonometry, you know that there are many many triangles that can have the same, like how to say, same hypotenuse, the same centripetal force, but different strength of pull. So that's like a sort of region, a region around this area where orbits can where objects are stable so that's why it's called the stable Lagrangian points L4 and L5 which you will have seen in the Astro Challenge during selection test which most of you guessed but that's okay because that's what everyone does in the first year and so that's it for our first lesson so thank you for checking in